Okay, welcome, let's get started. Today, we are going to be talking about writing and how to tell a story. My name is Paola Mendez, and I am the founder of the Blogger Union. The Blogger Union is a network of blogger communities dedicated to growing our members' brands and incomes through meetups and workshops, just like this one. We have communities all over the US, uh, for example, the DC Bloggers, Carly's here, she runs the DC Bloggers, but we have in Miami, in New York City, Houston, all over. And if you'd like to find out more about that, visit thebloggerunion.com. And my personal blog is Coral Gables Love, if you'd like to follow me there. Our speaker today is Aaron Curtis. He has been published in blogs, magazines, and books. Welcome, Aaron. How are you today? Thanks, Paula. I'm good. How are you? I like your background. Thank you. I made it. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> so before we get started, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. I've been in Miami since 96. Uh, I was born and raised in Syracuse, which is a college town in the middle of New York State. Um, I've been in, uh, well, I've been working for Books and Books since 2004. Um, what I like to write, I write short stories, I like memoir, I write a little bit of everything, which is, um, I wouldn't recommend it, you should probably specialize if you want to really push forward and get uh, published in success and accolades at, a, at an earlier time in your career. Uh, my first love is, is fiction, which is why I haven't had anything but rejection letters. I've only had nonfiction essays published. But uh, I, I, though for some reason that seems to resonate with uh, editors or whatever, people looking to publish work, the nonfiction has struck a chord. But so far the fiction has uh, got an interest. I have um, an agent that I am working with that uh, we're working towards my first novel and that was going, like I said, pre-pandemic, that was going pretty, uh, pretty well. But now we're just kind of keeping in touch and mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much for all the updates and the extra background. So let's get talking about writing. So there's different kinds of writing, as you mentioned. What makes storytelling different or unique? Uh, well, I think story is separated from other forms just because it, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, I mean, that's that's if you, I guess the, the like textbook accepted definition is that there's a resolution and that the characters go on a journey. You have to have, it's the resolution and the wrap up and the journey that the characters go through kind of separates it from a situation or an anecdote. It has to have kind of an arc to it. Um, yeah, story. Thank you. Well, I think what's interesting is that a story can be a, a fiction book, but we can also tell shorter stories. So. I know we have writers here who want to do like memoirs, uh, but we also have um, content creators who run blogs and, and want to start telling stories, just short, shorter versions of their stories in their social media. So it's what's interesting is that what is unique about storytelling and those components of having a middle, a beginning and an end, you can use that in all the kinds of writing that you're doing not just when you're writing a novel, right, Aaron? For sure, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the first thing, if you do have an, an online presence, the first thing that someone clicks to is the, your about page. And people are really focusing on that, like to try to get that tight and to have an a interesting story. Just someone, if you, if you read something online and you're like, oh, that's funny or that's interesting and you want to find out more about the person, you'll click through to their online presence and then, you go, you know, kind of scroll around and go, oh, about what is this person's deal? And that's your chance to possibly hook this stranger into, you know, thinking that you're interesting and funny and on a regular basis, and <laughs> maybe they should engage with you more often. That's absolutely right. Your About Me page is so important and also having your own website, but we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> so, okay. 
So you, you decided, we all learned how important it is to uh, tell a story because it's uh, more engaging and it, it's easier to make a connection with your audience. So how would you go about learning to be a storyteller or telling a story? What do you recommend? I recommend, um, if you read uh, Stephen King's on writing, um, he talks about, he calls it catch your rabbit which is basically catch a rabbit and skin it. Whatever you um, are trying to accomplish, whether it's uh, a blog that you really want to do, or if it's a, it's a novel, or if it's a memoir, or you really want to do spoken word poetry, whatever it is, expose yourself to a lot of it. Read a lot of it. Um, if, you, if it is something that takes place live, go for that. If it is like... Um, something that's on YouTube or a review page that you really enjoy, go and see. And the more that you focus on a lot of those different, um, you know, creators who are out there doing the work, it'll expose you to it. And it's better than, it's basically what a lot of classes are, is you go and they expose you to a lot of the work and you just kind of break it down. But the exposure is the really important part because those nuts and bolts, they can kind of, be limiting if you don't, um, if your work doesn't follow a specific A, B, C, D format, then it can be daunting or limiting. You start worrying about where does my voice fit into this larger pantheon of whatever. So if you can just grab content and read it, read, read, read all the time, that'll be the best uh, way Wait, to try to expose yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. I think. The, I agree, I, the best way to learn is to immerse yourself in whatever it is that you're trying to uh, write like. So for example, let's say you're a blogger and you want to um, submit an article for Condé Nast, right? So you want to be in, published in their magazine or maybe their blog. So first you want to get to know what style of writing that publication has. And the best way to get that is exactly what Aaron is saying. Read so many articles of Condé Nast that you kind of start to discover what is their style so that you can start writing in that style. That way your article is more likely to get uh, picked up as a contribution. But also now that we're talking about reading, reading and immersing yourself and picking up styles, <laughs> I have a, a question. And uh, is it okay to, um, as an exercise in uh, learning how to write a specific style, to imitate an existing author that you admire? I get you, you asked me this yesterday and I heartily agreed. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh it, it it's something that you should definitely definitely do i remember i submitted a short story once and someone actually asked me if it was a stephen king story this was we're going back to when i was 19 and i was going to you know conquer the world with my with my voice and and all that good stuff but yeah i mean the, pretty much all that pulpy horror was all i was writing and so that's what i that's what i was putting out there but um the important thing to do is not to when you when you only read one person you're a fan of one person then you can that um writing exercise that you're doing of trying to imitate that voice will come off as just as an imitation and as plagiarism it's important to read broadly so if it's if it is horror that you're interested in read a lot of different horror authors and then it becomes more of an amalgamation of, uh, of different voices, not just a pale imitation. And I think I told you about um, Austin Kleon. He has a whole, his, his first book, he has a trilogy for creatives that um, the first one is called Steal Like an Artist. And it's just 10 things that they don't tell you when you're getting started. Um, and we have that graphic. Let me put it up while you tell us about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But he has a, the first one's called Steal Like an Artist. The second one is called um, Show Your Work. And the third one is called Keep Going. So wherever you are at in your journey, he has a, a 
kind of resource, but the first one is Steal Like an Artist and it's really good um, kind of ground floor. It gives you different exercises, different just ways of thinking about getting into the writing process. And I love this graphic just because it kind of breaks down the whole point of what he means when he says steal like an artist because there is good theft and there is bad theft. And we see a lot of uh, different things where it's like diversity has become this buzzword so people are trying to write in a diverse manner, but as you can see here, unless you've studied it and you're honoring a certain subject or person or place or whatever that you're trying to write about, you can end up degrading that subject. So it's important to know the difference between good theft and bad theft. That's why I was talking about stealing from many versus stealing from one. It's reading all these different sources to try to find out what you like, what's working there, what's working for you, that can kind of inform what you're writing versus just, oh, I wanna be, I'm just gonna write Dickens. Right. And then I also like here that it says credit. Yeah. Because sometimes we are, are afraid of, uh, of giving credit uh, to our predecessors and who inspired us and who we're looking up to, but it's actually a good thing, right? Yeah, it 100% is. That's why your thank you page can be as long as you need it to be. <laughs> and I have read a lot. I have read some thank you pages that are like, um, they'll be like, the poem on page 50 owes a debt to Lucille Clifton's, you know, blank. And you're like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. And then you find that poem. And you go, oh, yeah, I see where, where it is. And it's different enough. It's, a, it's the own, but they felt like they used enough of that original source material to where they have to go, oh, I have to credit that person. Absolutely. And also when it comes to content creation, it actually crediting people really helps you grow. It helps you collaborate. You know, when someone realizes that, for example, this is something silly, like I put together uh, crafting tutorials in one of my many blogs, Dapper Animals, but when someone actually downloads the, the template and makes the thing and gives me credit for it, I, I reshare. I want to let the world know that I inspired this person. So giving credit is also a powerful tool to um, not obviously credit the person, but also to, you know, maybe get the word out about yourself as well. Okay, so um, let's talk about um, what makes a good story. I think it, it depends on who you ask. Uh, everyone's going to have their different idea. I mean, there's also, there's what's working for you as a reader. Uh, it should be, it should be engaging. It should be, it should be honest and authentic, uh, ideally in your own voice. Um, hopefully a little vulnerable so you can let some people in um, and just it, it shouldn't be it needs to be you because every, every the, the things that resonate with pe people it should be as specific as possible to you in order to make it general you should be writing to please you need to keep your reader in mind but you should write to please yourself first like, don't think about an audience who's going to be involved with this. That'll get in your head and screw you up. But, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, I really like how you're talking about, like, just authenticity, like being yourself and just being true to yourself and, you know, not lying <laughs> is huge into truly connecting with your reader. Because I feel like when you exaggerate and you're not, genuinely yourself it comes through and people can pick up on that and that really messes up that connection that you're trying to make with your, That's with true. your That's true. in some in some ways but it even applies to fiction though even if you're even if your your job is to lie on the page it needs to be true within the world that you've created. When you set up the rules of your story that's that's a little bit of trust with the reader. They're gonna you're starting off with uh, something romantic on the page and then 50 pages in, someone gets 
beheaded and you describe the scene in a very graphic and gory way and all of a sudden you you've betrayed that trust that's a form of lying you can still have a beheading but it has to be within that framework that you've already established with the reader and the the reader has to trust where you're going and has to trust your voice you don't have to hold their hand the whole time but you do have to guide them through what you're doing and if you are if you are lying if you are going, oh, I'm going to surprise them with this. You can put in surprises, but it has to honor this world that you've created. So even if you're, you know, even if it is a lie, it's all fiction. Right. It's it's ab really absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Keep that in mind. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So we're talking about what makes uh, a good story and its authenticity and, and you know, pour pouring yourself into the story. But they haven't analyzed all of the stories out there. And I know we all want to be unique, but tell, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how all of the stories out there have been boiled down to just a few stories? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I was telling you, I don't remember where I first heard the concept. It was like high school or college. And I tried to find out because it was like, I, I don't know if it's just this thing that's in the ether that's like there's only seven stories you can tell because no one officially did that until 2004 when that book was published but you know my high school college days are late 80s early 90s so <laughs> obviously it was in the ether so we think the origin was uh joseph campbell's a hero with a thousand faces mm -hmm. and it's basically those classic they looked at every story that's been um since the invention of the printing press anyway and they've broken them down into uh an adventure story, which would be Alice in Wonderland and Apollo 13 and Mad Max Fury Road, you know, but it's, it's like you, you have all these different, even though it's just an adventure story, you can broaden that out however, however you are, but at their base, they claim there's only seven different, uh, seven different stories. So do you, we have a graphic for that as well, right? Or no? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, the, okay. uh, We'll, we'll share it so that you guys can write them down. And this will help you when you're writing, uh, obviously give you ideas for your different stories. Mm -hmm. Right. Overcoming the monster, rags to riches, the quest, voyage and return, rebirth, comedy, tragedy. Um, but I, I don't think that you should set out to go, I'm going to write a comedy. I'm going to Right. I mean, maybe you do want to overcome a monster and that's what you're exploring on the page, but your end result shouldn't be what's on your mind. When you sit down, you should sit down, you should have inspiration, whatever that is to you, whatever, whether it's there's this thing in the news and I can't wrap my head around. So I'm going to explore it on the page. There's an image you have in your head of two people talking and you're, you don't know these people they are strangers, but you want to explore that a little bit. So you start to write that out. There is whatever that is, that little kernel, you should just be exploring that. And without thinking about where am I going with this? Is this going to be a sci-fi? Is it going to be a period piece? Whatever it is, just explore whatever it is that brought you to sit down in front of a computer or a longhand or a typewriter, however you're going to do it and right you shouldn't i don't i don't think you should you should let other people you should let the academics say well this is sort of a rebirth but it's also overcoming the monster you know let them parse that out okay. i just think it's interesting that even though there are only those seven stories think of all the different you know thousands and thousands of varieties you can do it says no one will tell your rebirth story the way you would tell it the difference between you and every other thousands of man in a hole stories out there is that no one has told it in your voice the way you would tell it. And the only way to find your voice is to write a lot. Absolutely. Write a lot. But going back for one second, I really like what you said about like, don't because okay, there's the plots, like all these different types of stories. And you're like, don't try to set off to write a comedy, just uh, start from your moment of inspiration. But I think that's also important to keep in mind with just the structure of the story and we talked about this yesterday uh you know the story has that beginning that middle and the end but maybe um 
you don't want to sit down and start thinking about those three pieces. You just want to start with that moment of inspiration and just like dump all of that out of your head onto the page. And then that when is when you get into the editing part of it, right? Is that? Yeah, yeah. You're ex you should be exploring and it should be fun. And a lot of times you'll get a hundred pages in before you even know who your main characters are. Because you started with those two people who were talking to each other, but then you realized it was the person two tables over or two rooms over that was listening in on that. That was actually your main character who is a lot more interesting, but who you didn't meet until a hundred pages in. And maybe the beginning is 50 pages in, you don't know. And I'm a big believer in a finished work because this, the strongest the strongest stories out there know, I mean, when we talk about it as a marketing perspective, as you know, about me, obviously none of us know where we're ending. So hopefully you're ending that open ending. I'm working on this <laughs> just, to, just to give that little teaser. But uh, yes, I mean, unless you do want to write your ending in your about page, that would be very unique. Uh, and he died at 120 surrounded by friends and loved ones and millions of riches. But I'm a big believer in a finished work because the strongest stories know where they where they ended up. And there's a difference between sitting down and having that in mind and having written towards that than writing it all out until you finish the story and finding out in the process where the beginning, middle, and end is. Because once you have a finished piece, then you know because you know exactly where you're going, how to tease the reader forward. Like, oh, I'm gonna give them, I'm gonna give you a little taste here of this. I'm gonna give you a little flash here of this. And you're just drawing them towards the end where you know exactly where it is. And it doesn't mean you can't jump around. If you have, if you have built this beautiful sandwich and it's a giant sub sandwich and you have your, your characters in the middle and your solid plot is the, and all that good stuff, you can chop that up however you want into little slices and move those slices around. But you can only do that once you've built the whole sub. <laughs> whole sandwich. <laughs> I love that. But uh, so to keep that in mind, I know Aaron, he is a writer and he writes books. And so I know we have a lot of content creators here. And so don't get discouraged when he says you have to write 100 pages to figure out your thing. You know, it's happened to me writing a blog post as well. Like I go uh, on a trip, I have an experience and I come back and I'm not really even sure how I want to, you know, share my experience or what it is that, you know, I, I want to share from it. And it's not until I just, you know, sit down a blank page and just kind of dump any anything that came to mind. And once I'm done with that, that's when I realize, you know, this is how I want to tell this story of what happens when I did this. So that's a great tip. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, um, Okay, uh, we've talked about a reader and uh, not really just exploring yourself and not um, caring much about the reader, but you do have to keep in mind the reaction of the reader. So um, how do you find out how people are going to react to your stories? How can you get feedback? Yeah. It's, at some point, you're going to have uh, a story that's finished enough that you can't that you can't take any further on your own. Um, and we talked about don't get discouraged by writing hundreds of pages. What the, one of my favorite things that ever was John Dufresne's um, lie that tells a truth is one of the best on writing you will you will ever read in your life. John Dufresne's lie that tells a truth. And one of his things is his it, he says don't ever subject anyone to the horror of a first draft. It is great to be, and I please learn from my experience. When I was when I was first started writing and I was hitting it hard and I'm like, I'm gonna finish a novel by the time I'm 30. I did that and I was so proud of that accomplishment that I did share that with people. I inflicted it on them. And oh my God, I'm 
wildly embarrassed by that now. <laughs> you should sit with your story until you've taken it as far as you can on your own. But at some point, unless you are going to store that in a drawer for years at a time, so you can get some distance and some perspective and know where you've made your mistakes and where you've gone wrong and questions you've left open, you need fresh eyes that aren't yours. So you're going to find a writer's group of like-minded souls who also have work that they've created that they wanna share so that you're gonna all, all share work. And if we're talking about different levels of writing, um, I've only had a couple of mixed, most of, most of the time we're working on short fiction or we're all working on a novel. Um, it was only once where one person was working on a memoir as well. And uh, that actually it seemed to work fine. So I wouldn't, I don't think, the only thing I think I would probably limit yourself to is like, if you're doing scripts, find other script writers. If you're doing um, poetry, find other poets. But you do have to find a group that can I, do your work. I love that. I feel like it, um, as content creators, um we don't really have this focus on our writing and we're always so focused on the visuals that sometimes we don't focus on the writing and we don't work on that as much as our visuals so we're always taking pictures we're always figuring how to edit photos and learning how to do video but the words are always there, right? <laughs> you have to write those captions, you have to write those blog posts, you know, hopefully you write books uh, about what you, you know about also. So I've never really heard about a writing group for content creators. And I think that's such a brilliant idea. And I think we have 40 people here right now. And if you guys do not have a writer's group, you can do it online and if you're looking for some feedback on your writing and trying to get you know get your writing to improve i would highly recommend going in the chat <laughs> and asking people who are kind of talking about maybe your same niche or i know we have different types of writers here in 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 the as per, uh, attending today so you can maybe share in the chat what type of writing that you do uh, so that maybe you can find a group uh, of writers right now if you haven't participated in because Aaron uh, really sold that idea for me. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of different groups on Facebook that uh, that, that, you, do that. You know, that you can look for or you can start one there. Yeah, there's enough people on this chat to do that. Right. How many people do you recommend having in a writer's group? Um, I think six is a good number. That way at least four people will show up oh, okay. but it's like you could do six to eight it's always um uh i mean minimum four is a good number to to show up every time and there's some people who are going to have work every single time to present there's some people who are going to be every other um but it's important that everybody does contribute because you need to get a sense of how this person writes and how they give feedback just know if you can uh if you can trust them if they're if they understand your work and if they're bringing out the best in you and hopefully you can do the same for them um but it's very important that everyone participate just because there's that level of uh of vulnerability and trust that you need um it's like karaoke if everyone's taking a turn then you know you're not going to get you're not going to heckle that person because you're going to get heckled next so everyone has to bring something to the table. Uh, wonderful. So John is saying in the chat that you can get up, you can get caught up in, uh, but you can get caught up in other people's work. Do you have something to share with John regarding that? I think I, I, we, we hinted at this yesterday because uh, I said something about you have to know when to, when to leave a writer's group. Mm. Yes, I have. We have had two, two writers groups that have broken up and reformed because there was one person that was dominating. And when that happens, it becomes obvious after maybe six months that 
this one person, which is six meetings. Um, I mean, it comes obvious to the point where everyone else will want to address it, but it depends. If you don't have that person who is confrontational, who's going to say, uh, uh, you know, you need to limit yourself. But a lot of these people, they don't have that. They don't have the realization that they are doing that and dominating the conversation and taking all the feedback for themselves. So a lot of times you just have to break up that group and reform. It's like a form of ghosting. And you just have to, when they're like, oh, you guys still meet? You're like, oh no, you know, we, we, we all got busy and we, and we stopped. It's, yeah, it's a real shame. But yeah, yeah, we have, to, we have to get back together. But I mean, in one case, this, this person who went, who dominated everything has gone on to, you know, publish short story collections and is still has essays and everything published. Uh, the other person I haven't heard anything from, but I mean, yeah, if someone's coming to dominate, it's definitely not doing the rest of anybody else any good, so. Right, and if you're all introverts, I guess the solution is to ghost that person, according yeah. to Aaron. I mean, <laughs> we're writers, we're more comfortable, <laughs> I mean, me, I'm more comfortable with the blank page than, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> tough. But I mean, like, I, like you said yesterday, you were talking about how do you know you can trust that person's feedback because you're all kind of at the same level. I mean, if you do have that one person who's a mentor who has, you know, six novels in but doesn't have her professional peers who also have a bunch of novels published, but still needs feedback because even, you know, however many novels in, you still need second readers and all that good stuff. But a lot of times it's people they have their you know, professional peer group. But if someone doesn't and they're willing to, for lack of a better word, meet with amateurs, that could be the person who you approach and go, listen, this is like getting out of hand with this, you know, this yeah. one member, maybe they can address it. But those, those writers groups are, are rare or more rare. So nice. yeah, usually it's just a very, Immature, petty. I wish I had a better, you know, a <laughs> better, more grown up, responsible answer, but I, <laughs> I don't because I don't, I don't want to crush anyone's creative urges. And, and you know, it, it, but so, at some point, some people, they need therapy more than they need <laughs> a writer's group. And see, the, he knows what I'm saying. Yes. And it's some, <laughs> yes. And you can't, you can't offer that service right but i think you, class know, you mentioned <laughs> i think you mentioned something really interesting and it's like okay we're gonna start for example we're about to we have people as, uh, wanting to start their writers group in the chat right now and we have kim who is currently trying to focus on fictional short stories if there's anybody else who would like to start a writers group with her uh amaka writes recipe blogs i write about travel Ilanka does short story lifestyle blogs. And I feel like um, you should also not be so hesitant to uh, start a group of uh, a writer's group with amateurs because everyone has, even if they are not like professional writers, they have their authentic reaction to reading. We're all, we definitely all have readers and we definitely have are just innate reactions to things. So maybe they can't give you the feedback as to what you should do, but they can tell you what emotion they are, you're causing in them with your writing. So even if it's just you're getting together and you guys want to like improve your Instagram captions and like your, your writing in some way that is not authentic, that's putting people off, you know, the other writers in the group can t give you that feedback. It was like, this is not coming off as you. <laughs> so maybe you should, you know, try something else. So um, we also have Annette. She's 16. Welcome, Annette. And she's writing about a lot of topics and focusing on her romance novel. She's a beginner, but very passionate. Oh, that's amazing. I love it how we're starting writers groups in the chat. <laughs> And Leah is cheering her on. Okay, wonderful. So um, I think we just have one more question. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to add them to the chat. And we will start taking questions from the audience. 
and we uh, talked a little bit about engaging our readers' emotions. Um, do you have any um, advice on how to to engage our readers' emotions with our writing and learn how to do that? Um, hmm. I mean, that's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> because we're all we're all there's a thousand things that someone could do with their day, a thousand things people could have their eyeballs on. There's, you know, there, we're in Instagram world, we're in Twitter world. And the reason people look towards a piece of writing is I think we're losing a lot of connection in all this ability to always be connected in a glib way on, on social media. We're kind of losing a connection. So what a story can offer is something real and I think the key piece of that is being being vulnerable and being truthful, and to uh, to do that, you just have to you just have to keep writing. You have to keep putting pen putting words to paper, and at some point you will find your authentic voice. And you know, it's like these it's like these essays that that have connected with people. Um, readers will tell you what works for them. As far as I wish I had a magic, magic bullet that could just be, oh my God, I'm going to open this. I think it's being unique. If, it, if it, what, what grabs me, even if it's a story I've heard, uh, you know, many times before, if, if the writer expresses it in a unique way, then I will, you'll have my eyeballs for the duration of that. Um, and a lot of that, I think specificity also has a lot to do with it as well. We talked about that, um, that guy who, who his first draft of his, of his uh, essay, he was talking about how difficult of a time he had um, mentoring his, uh, or his daughter was starting to date and he was struggling with that. And when he revised his opening line, it was, uh, um, I would rather be getting knocked around on the football field in college was preferable than talking to my 16 year old about dating. And it just had to do with as soon as possible, letting the reader in just a little bit of who they're talking to and what their, what their authentic voice is. Um, yes, that's great advice. But also yesterday you talked a little bit about just like being very uh, observant of the world and the people around you and that you can um, discover, you know, what makes people, you know, what makes people tick so that you can start adding that in your story. Yeah, for sure. D.H. Lawrence said that if you're not curious about the world, you're a terrible writer. And that's always stuck with me. I'm just like, I'm wondering if I'm curious enough, but because you do, you have to be a student of human nature. His stories have to interest you on some level. You have to, eavesdropping is a great thing to do in public. If you're struggling with dialogue, um, watch some shows that ring true to you. Unless you're trying to write for a sitcom, then watch some sitcoms and, try to find out what they're doing. That goes back to your point of whatever you're trying to write for, study it. But yeah, you need to be a student of human nature and try to, you know, get to some, to try to move someone emotionally is a, is a, it's a hard thing to do. But if you are reading enough and experiencing enough that is moving you, then hopefully when you go to reenact that on the page, you'll be able to do that for the reader. And in some level, if you were able to read your own work and get, if it can move you on an emotional level, your own, your own work, sometimes it can tell you you're on the right track. Sometimes it can tell you you're too attached, which is why you do need another set of eyes to go, oh, that piece that you loved, it's, causing more harm than good. And then, because a lot of times you'll find that people get it. Mm -hmm. 
because we all bring our own experiences to the page with what we're reading. So you don't necessarily need to show as much as you are showing, so. Absolutely. And I really like that you mentioned that if, because you're talking about your own writing. If your own writing is moving you, then you're on the right track, that's good. But also, if you want to be able to reach other people's emotion, and you're observant of how you react emotionally in the world. So like, that's a good, just, you know, cause like you have different modes of going around the world about your business. <laughs> you can be aloof or you can be like observant about like how you react to different things. And if you're able to catch those things that cause a reaction, then I think those are the key things that you want to include in your writing. And I am an introvert and I am, I pick up on people's emotions a lot. So I, sometimes I find myself angry and I'm not angry, but I'm standing next to someone who's angry. <laughs> so if uh, you can, you know, you can catch those moments. I think those would help you uh connect with your readers yeah a lot um, of actors talk about that they talk about when they're in public they get uh i don't know i watch these interviews and they're like oh your character did like a really specific greeting and they're like oh yeah i saw this guy doing that once and i was like that's so weird i'm putting that into you know into a character but yeah the more you observe the more dickens said that the, that the most fully fleshed out character on a page is nothing but a bag of bones so you will steal from life all the time you will see anything that sticks with you you're just like oh my god i'm gonna use that and yeah so just always try to sponge up as much as you can okay wonderful um so i don't really see any questions from the audience uh liz joined us welcome liz uh, we will have the replay available sent to everyone in case you'd like to rewatch this and catch those slides with uh, the good theft versus the bad theft and the different um, storylines. Uh, we do have a question. One thing we did, we talked about yesterday that uh, didn't come up today because mm -hmm. this was a, a story thing. I've heard from uh, the first person I read it from was Paul Oster. He started um, translating which is how he, his first couple of books that were published were uh, English translations of, of uh, I think Spanish. And he had never written a book, but doing that and having to recreate it gave him a sense of what the author was doing in story and uh, really gave, helped him with his own attempt when he, when he sat down to write his first novel. He, he said that that was great. And it always kind of stuck with me because I'm not bilingual. So I was just like, wow, that's really amazing that he had that. And then as I have watched other authors present at Books and Books, that comes up a lot. And I know you mentioned that we have a lot of people international. So if you do have that skill, it might be something you, you know, don't do it for free. <laughs> if you can't, if you, you know, maybe as, as a last ditch resort, um, if you want to do it as a writing exercise to help you learn how to craft a story, you can translate something. But uh, yeah, I definitely recommend that from what I've heard from other authors. Okay, wonderful. Actually, we do have some questions coming in and we do have to end right on the dot today. So let's see if we can get to these through these quickly. So we have a couple of people asking about what to do after you finish a book, you know, um, and someone, one specifically, Leah is asking about publishing and um, and uh, I forget who was the person asking, once you're done with the book, uh, where do you find an editor? What do you do? Um, when you have a finished writer's group, the best thing you can have if you, you need to find, uh, you need to find a writer's group. But if you're specifically uh, working on a novel, a lot of times it helps if you find other writers who are working on a novel especially if you have a finished one, because then you can decide how you want to do it because it can involve a lot of reading. So you go, oh, well, we'll all share 30 pages at a time and see what, see where we're going, see what's working, see what needs more fleshing out, all that kind of stuff. Or you can say this month, we're going to read 
120 pages of just this one person, the next month we'll read 120 pages. There's no quick fix because if you, and again, I speak from experience, if you send that first draft to that guy that you know who's a sales rep for HarperCollins, you know, he's gonna enjoy very greatly in introducing you as a, as a great writer forever, but you're not, it's not gonna get you anywhere because that, if you share it too soon, you risk it all just falling apart. You need to have other eyes on it. It needs to be as strong and as tight as you can get it. Your next step, once you finish a novel, should be working on it some more. <laughs> Actually, the first step should be congratulating yourself because it's not easy. You should take some time to celebrate the fact that you did it, but definitely get some other eyes on it. As far as once you have done that, that diligence of, I have gotten as much as I can and I think this is as strong as it can be on its own. The reality is you need an agent. Any, the small publishing houses, the big publishing houses, they are not going to look at a book without an agent. And there are, we're fortunate to be here in Miami where you can actually go to the uh, Miami Book Fair that used to be the Florida Center for the Literary Arts, but they just, they decided to just be Miami Book Fair all year round for every event that they have. They have many meet an agent events. Oh, that's um, cool. So you can sign up for one of those, go, you get, um, I think 10 or 15 minutes one-on-one. -on -one. Also, um, if you are, once we are past the pandemic and you get to go to live book events, events agents frequent those mm. so if you can if you can do it in a subtle way that looks like you're asking the author a question you know uh i would like to know what should i do with my young adult you know dragon living in a basement novel and then the agent might come up to you afterwards which was how i found my agent at a live at a live book event no um, way that's awesome yeah yeah <laughs> all right let's keep going because we do have a couple of questions and i we have to end time today so we also, liz is asking how do you get over the fear of not being good enough mm. that's a really 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 good question and i still struggle with it a lot i huh i think it does if you have those little victories when you do start sharing your work of someone who sends you a message i read a short story that you published and oh my god it was this and that can hit you on a day where you're feeling really low and i'm uh i'm gonna turn 49 this year and like i said i had i had finished my first book when i was 30. it's not published and it will not be because it's it was an exercise. It was 350 pages of a writing exercise. But I have faith, but it gets harder every year. And I think if you can celebrate those little victories, the people you are sharing your work with in your writer's group that are giving you feedback, because a lot of those can get emotional in a good way. Because if you are, um, if you are writing something that's moving and the, the your writer's group, when you find a good one, can help you with that, then you will see the effect that it's having and that can keep you moving forward. But I, the, remember what when we talked about Donna Tart? No. She, she, I mean, she's three books, she's Donna Tart, Pulitzer Prize winner, oh my God, all hail her, her prose is just, oh my God. And she writes at the top of every page that she's writing, this doesn't matter. Right. So. Just remember, it doesn't matter. If you want to write to change the world, stop. <laughs> if you want to write to change yourself, that you can do. Well, I think there's all, I love, I love all of that advice. Writing on top of the page, this doesn't matter. Celebrating the, the little milestones. But there's also this other um, way of looking at your writing. And you're right, taking a look at your writing and thinking of it's not your writing that there is something that wants to get written through you and you are just an instrument and there's this uh good that's quote. for poetry 
really it doesn't work for real writing anywhere because there's I could. Kind of really could. a lot of yeah i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but that's like i feel like that's how poems come to people it's just like oh okay but uh i have this quote from Anne lamont the author of bird by bird and she says you just have to keep getting out of your own way so that whatever it is that wants to be written can use you to write it so when some you know I, that's another strategy to use you know to consider that what it is that you're writing is is not even your own so that you're not a judge you're not judging what you're doing as you're doing it and you know you kind of step out of your own way um so that's another way to see that liz also asks are there any good tools tech tools time management tools apps that you love that help your with your creativity um i can't remember the name of it but uh uh zadie smith uses a social media blocker that limits her to an hour a day. Mm -hmm. She actually, the, the giant hiatus that was in her writing was because of social media. And she was like, she wrote this whole essay about how, you know, she wondered if she was ever gonna publish a book again because it was taking up so much of her time. Um, as far as uh, sparking creativity, I think it's I think it's important to have uh, a secondary and um, uh, Liz Gilbert writes about this in in uh, Big Magic. Um, she talks about uh, like a passion for gardening, really helping this one writer. For me, it's cooking. Like I big I have a big I plan my menus for the week. What are we gonna eat? This whole thing. I go to my shopping for the week. Here's what we you know I, I treat it as like. My, my big passion and if that's off then I find that I have I have too much heat on what am I doing with my writing there's so much pressure on this is my thing this is my creative outlet this is what I'm doing to make myself heard and what I'm putting out in the world and it's so important that you can't you're too tight you that pressure on on that one thing you're doing is way too loose so you should be dancing you should be singing you should be doing something to offset whatever your main creative focus is, to take the pressure off of that, something that you find joy in that is also a creative outlet. I love how I don't you know bring about up app base, but uh, <laughs> I love how you bring up back up your love for cooking because I've seen you also add that to your stories, and that one way it was the recipe for chili, so <laughs> it was great. So um, Joy asked, um, how would I get about getting my pub poetry published and we talked about looking for an agent but is there maybe uh places you can submit story uh, your poetry to be published without having to publish your own book yeah. of poetry the the agent was for was for novels i want to say that um oh, okay but yeah i mean the big joke from the from the poets <laughs> because the poetry commissions are are like they're very 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 small you are you're choosing a pauper's life but you you can't you know poetry chooses you but uh yeah you do your own submissions and your own work especially anything essays short stories all of that stuff you can do all of your own um and whatever you're reading online usually they'll have a submission page read that follow their guidelines find out who those people are go to twitter find out when they're opening open for submissions so where if you're wondering where to publish your poems find something you're a fan of where poems are already being published and see where you fit in there. But yeah, don't worry about an agent unless you're like trying to shop a novel around. Okay. But yeah, like anything, I'm sorry if I gave that impression, that's that's way wrong. Okay. Yes, that's, you do your own you for the clarification. For sure. I'm glad that question came so, up. Wow. So Leah is asking <clears throat> about publishing essays and, and such to start. Is it similar to poetry or is there a difference there? I think definitely you have, it's the same thing. You would go and find, you're, you're reading, uh, you're at The Believer, you're at uh, uh, The Rumpus, you're at uh, uh, Brain Droppings, whatever it is that you're digging, you're like, oh, I want to I wanna write for this. Then hopefully you've been a fan of it long enough that you, that you have a sense of what they are. And you can go to the submission page, they have guidelines, follow them, send it in. Um, if it's someplace you've never written for before, then you would do, like Paula said earlier, you're going to do the research of what is this voice, where can mine fit in, 
and you see all those you always go to writer's twitter and if you can if you can avoid the doom scrolling you know i have never done this but i just hear the mute button is like a great thing to mute certain buzzwords or whatever so then twitter can be what you want it to be but if you can get those people who are celebrating that victory of i shopped this essay around to 10 different people and got 10 different rejection letters but this 11th person said yes then that can help you move forward but definitely um writer's class radio i think as i mentioned that earlier but that those guys are based out of miami um they have a whole page that's like submit your work here and it's all just links to some of them are dead links but you can still go to those uh pages and find out you know where to submit okay great that was all wonderful advice Aaron, thank you so much. We do still have more questions coming in, but like today, I unfortunately definitely have to end up on time. Do you have anything I'm coming up that you'd like to share with us? Anything in books and books, any? If you, what's today? The 16th. 16th. Tomorrow, you'll hear my name in the news with a, an announcement with the, uh, National Book Awards, which is going to be very time consuming for me from now until September. So that's what I have coming up. But yeah, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> that's um, amazing. But yeah, shop indie. Shop, if you can, if you can afford it, shop at independent bookstores. Yes. And if you're if you're looking for one to support booksandbooks.com or books and books physical locations all around Florida are amazing. So support your indie bookstore. Thank you so much for joining us, Aaron, and sharing all of your writing tips and experience. Uh, I hope you guys start your writers groups. If uh, you felt overwhelmed, too much was going on, and you want to re reach out to people, the chat at the bottom has three little dots. If you click there, it gives you the option to save the chat. And that way, you can go back and reach out to other people who attended and shared their Instagram handles or their email and you can get your writers groups going. I think that is such a great idea. I'm so excited to see how you guys move forward with those. Um, we have yeah, another if you tweet me questions as well. Oh, if you want I'm sorry, if you want to tweet me questions as well, go ahead. Uh, I have to turn my Airbnb over and then I have to go to work. Okay. But <laughs> All right, one, <laughs> wonderful. Then tweet at Aaron if you have questions. Check out the bloggerunion.eventbrite.com for the list of our other upcoming events and webinars. And we will see you next time. Thank you everyone for joining and participating. You are a wonderful and engaged audience. Thanks, Paula. You're a tremendous host. Thank you, Aaron. I'll see you around. All right. Bye. Bye.